going to say, uh, Ruth, take over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, I was, I was, uh, I've been uh, dreading this for months now. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of pleased to log in and the um, social time and just see my buddies. <laughs> They're online. It's like, oh, okay, it's a small crowd. And I know these guys, no worries. Um, but then I kind of paged through the long list a few minutes ago and now I'm nervous again. Um, <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen right away. Um, get my slideshow up, see if I can manage it. Okay, do you see my slide? We do. Yes. All right. Okay, um, how did I, I guess, get into woodworking or, and get roped into this presentation too? Um, I've been a member of the guild for about six years and uh, participated in product build for a lot of that time. Um, I miss those folks, I haven't been as involved the last year or two though. Um, thinking about how, why am I doing this woodworking stuff? I remember my, my parents and family. And uh, when I went to college, I majored in French and chemistry. And the chemistry I kind of got from my dad and then I went into engineering and uh, French from my mom but those reflect kind of an interest in a lot of different things. I've always been interested in lots of different things. And so it was my family. And um, there was always a lot of hands-on things going around the home and the, our families and our friends, whether it was sewing or cooking or building parts of the house or doing some woodworking. I always enjoyed doing all those different things. And my woodworking journey is a little bit like that too. Um, I, one of my little mantras for myself is um, I, uh, I aspire to mediocrity, mediocrity in many things. Um, there's just so many interesting things to do. So in woodworking, I've done some chair building and some spoon making and some carving and Kumiko looked interesting too. So I've been doing some of that. Um, how's that for an intro to me? I think it's great. Uh, so today um, I'm not an expert in Kumiko by any means, but I've been immersing myself in it a little bit, and I think I can be a guide to help the rest of you learn a little bit more about it. A lot of my slides I've pulled off the internet. Um, I'll do. I'll give some background on what it comes from, and I've found lots of pictures of very interesting woodworking examples. How woodworkers in the last ten years and especially the last two or three years, are finding ways that Kumiko can enhance their woodworking. And then lastly, I'll show you how this, there's a little coaster at the bottom of the screen there, um, and I'll show how that can be made. And that's what we've been making in the guild. And that particular pattern is called Asa no Ha, which is a hemp leaf. So you can see there's sort of a flower or hemp leaf pattern there. And as I'm showing the woodworking examples, you'll see that that pops up all over. It's probably, of the pictures I found, it's probably 90% of the projects. And um, that's because it's really beautiful. And as I discovered recently, it's really maybe one of the easiest ones to make. I tried something else that looked simpler and it was really quite a bit more difficult. So even though it looks kind of cool, it's really quite easy to make. So um, Kumiko is part of Shoji, and you're probably familiar with the, the sliding screens with the translucent rice paper on them that are, are part of traditional Japanese temples and, and um, some homes. And here's an example of a very traditional place. Here's kind of a picture that shows you the relationship of uh, of a formal traditional Japanese environment where you see the screens on the, the interior surrounding the tatami room. Those are shoji screens and they slide on rails. We've got a couple shoji at the guild in the shop between the library area and the machine room. Uh, and the rice paper on them is not really weather resistant. So 
these are interior partitions. The exterior, there's glass covered panels, which have a different name. Another part of the tradition kind of is these upper ranma, which are screens higher up that maybe are for ventilation or additional light. And then um, this shoji has evolved with lots of the designs as samurai came into power and needed to have very cool places to show their power. They got more complicated screens built and the more and more designs of how to pull in different designs of those screens were developed. And this is a modern set of screens, which is pretty amazing. And inside that lattice are several different um, patterns. And those patterns would be called Kumiko, Kumiko designs. Here's a fairly straightforward set of screens, shoji, four different panels, and it's got three different designs. You've got a central design, which is pretty open, a design at the bottom, and then the ranma at the top shows yet another design. Here is a display screen that uh, Des King, who I'm going to mention a lot, has, he's written four books and he shows how to make this screen in his book. It's not a full size one. It's kind of a, here's a, a learn to make a shoji project. And uh, he's got a wonderful design where you can see the lattice work, the, up, the verticals and horizontals are pretty clever the way he's designed them. And those vertical and horizontal pieces of wood, that is kumiko. Kumiko is small pieces of wood. And then the designs in it are also referred to as kumiko or kumiko designs. And he's got at least three different patterns in this. And the top, the top row and the bottom row, I believe are also this asa no ha pattern. When it comes to furniture, this is the first time I saw Kumiko and furniture. This is a 2017 fine woodworking. I think it was like at the back page when they have that sort of showcase piece of work. And then there was a little bit of discussion of how it was made. Um, and I still just love this. I'm thinking, you know, I need to make this because <laughs> it's, it's really cool how this is, it's like a mid-century modern kind of a design. And then the Kumiko has been brought in and it works. By the way, this table would have a little glass piece over the top of the Kumiko pattern itself. It's beautiful. The same, the same woodworker, um, I can't, I don't know his name, but Big Sand Woodworking, or I guess John Billing was the name. Here's another more recent project where he's taken one of the shoji designs or Kumiko designs that's often in a shoji and he's made that pattern the whole top of the table. Again, I think he adds a piece of glass. Jigumi, by the way, is the name for the grid work that the Kumiko designs go into. Here's another fine woodworking uh, piece that was featured back in 2012. And I think this piece has been referred to by both Mike Pekovich and Matt Kenny, if you're familiar with them. They've both done a lot of Kumiko work and included it in their books. I believe they both refer to having seen this as one of their inspirations. Here's some of Mike Pekovich's work. And he of course was at the Guild a month or two ago doing a, um, a box and Kumiko project. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, Mike Pekovich has developed his style from arts and crafts style. Some of the other things are different woodworking styles. But the Kumiko fits right in. Here he's got a mirror. Again, kind of an arts and crafts style mirror, but with this Kumiko pattern. And here you see this Asanoha again, but it's only half a flower or half a leaf, but it sort of zigzags and it, it looks really cool. Ruth, can I interrupt on structure? Uh, yes. We had a question 
about uh, whether on the on the table where there's glass over the top, is there something supporting the kumiko on the bottom? Uh, a rabbit. It's supported in a rabbit. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. And then the legs, the, the legs have a, of a batten. The legs are attached to a batten, which runs all the way across. You know, I think it's actually in a dovetail that runs all the way across that holds that table together. Great. Any other questions? Don't worry, there'll be more. Okay. <laughs> this is a shoe bench, which is also pretty cool. Incorporates a lot of kind of Japanese feeling of like a feeling of a tansu with the sliding doors. Uh -huh. This one, you've got this same Asanoha design on the left part, but it's not in a square grid or a square jigumi. It's in a hexagonal one. And the asan, the, so the hemp leaf, it's very similar, but different. Wow. I didn't expect to see something like this. <laughs> That's how I was looking to see. I didn't expect to see Kumiko in a bed. more projects. On the right, the wall cabinet by Matt Kenny. Um, he started out using not so much the Kumiko patterns, but the, the Kumiko grid work. And then he's expanded that also into lots of work with patterns. Again, these are, you know, a lot of these are pretty modern styles. I mean, they're all modern works. Um, but they're a little bit variations in styles, and they've managed to pull this kumiko in in different ways. That that works. Some work slightly better than others, but they all work. Ruth, there's a comment here from. Uh, oops, I lost it. Was it Trevor? Yeah, it's from Trevor. It's um, I believe the second pattern in the previous piece is called Goma. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know they all have names. I'm not going to attempt to. Mm -hmm. I figured just getting through my presentation will be a success. <laughs> uh, and here's a, a, a panel or a screen that Des King has made, um, which again shows some different use of the, the, the grid work in the back, the main grid work, but then incorporating pattern across the middle. Just all kinds of opportunity for creativity. Taking this traditional art form and putting it into some new variations. Um, Matt Kenny, who I mentioned, has uh, written a book called The Art of Kumiko. And in that book, he um, shows how to make 10 different patterns, this uh, square Asanoha and nine other ones. And he also has uh, 10 panel projects. Like on the left, he's got this dis display panel with three different sizes of the Asanoha. He also goes into the machining of how to make the wood, wood kumiko pieces on the bottom and how to make uh, the gauges, the bevel jigs that you use to shave the angles and how you cut the lap joints. And so it's really a good book um, to have if you want to do more than make one coaster. It's really got a lot of, quite a bit of stuff in there. Mike Pekovich goes into, he stays more basic on it in, in his the, um, the why and how of woodworking, he shows several of his projects which incorporate Kumiko and he talks about making the, this square, um, the square Asanoha. But Matt Kenny goes into several other variations and Des King goes into many, many, many other variations. By Matt Kenny. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Kenny likes to put fabrics behind the Kumiko, the top box lid has kind of like a calico pattern behind it. It has a really, is a dark blue, but with a really little pattern. And it's pretty neat where it's like miniature screens with some interesting pattern. I like that a lot. Well, hopefully my inter connection, internet connection won't go too unstable. These Japanese lanterns were made by my neighbor, 
just down the street. And uh, he was doing some hand tool woodworking and making some end on. And I, I told him, oh, I'm making these Kumiko things. They're pretty neat. You know, check it out. You want to try it? And so <laughs> I lent in some stuff and he incorporated the, them into his lantern. Here's some lanterns by Des King. And here's a really elaborate one that Des King made. Um, I think some of the, I, I'm not positive, but I think some of these were sort of for, for, for shows or um, conferences and things, really a showpiece. Jeez. That's a stunner. I know I kind of, that would be a lot, quite a bit, quite a few Kubico to make, but I like that one. It's kind of like a disco ball. This is pretty neat where you've got, you've got a weighty edge as well as some Kumiko, it's pretty neat. This Japanese company I came across, they make some screens, like these huge elaborate screens, like for fancy restaurants or corporate offices, things like that. As well as little projects like this. So we're kind of getting to a little bit more accessible starter potential projects. Not so much this one's, it's pretty big, but Something like this is really beautiful and, and within our reach, <laughs> getting started. Oh, here's, cool. Dick's tea, here's Dick's tea box. So Dick Harbert, who's, who's in the meeting, made this, these tea boxes for Christmas as gifts with both inlay and Kumiko. And uh, I'm going to see if I can't get on Dick's Christmas list for next year, because yeah. I think they turned out really great. <laughs> and then, so then, so then I'm going to talk about how to make these. Well, how do you, how do you put this thing together? Um, and this is a project that I did. It's got two Asanoha leaves framed by some more pieces, and then that I made a frame to go around it. Um, and as I'm going through and showing these processes, I'm not going to go step by step and get into every little nitty gritty thing. It's, there's a lot of steps and it's, it's kind of, each step is fairly straightforward, but putting them all together in the sequence is kind of critical to make it work out. And I'm not going to go into that. There's also three different projects that pop around in the pictures. So there's not always a, and it's not just one project that you'll see pictures of. Here's um a picture from Mike Pekovich's fine woodworking article. And it shows uh, the, the small piece that he made and it shows his beveled jigs and it shows a little holder that he uses. I'm gonna try to kind of point this with my little cursor, I wave it around this little piece here, mm -hmm. um, helps hold the, these little work pieces in the groove here as they're being shaved. And uh, I don't have any pictures of that, but later on um, I'll probably, I'll mention it again. Here's the, uh, the books, some of the books. We saw Matt Kenny's book, but uh, Des King has four books. The first two, uh, he goes through a complete shoji build and introduces some different patterns. And then in the third and fourth book, he goes into lots of detail and lots of different patterns. And between the four books, he said he's got more than 100 patterns. Um, so if you're excited about lots of different things, I think these are a great investment. They're not all that expensive. They're easy to get a hold of on Amazon. And he does build on each book. So if you get book three, he's going to tell you to go to book one to do certain things. So I got started in this as uh, our women's SIG was meeting online uh, during the pandemic and um, didn't have, we couldn't all get in the shop together. And I was thinking, what? Maybe we could, this Kumiko would be something that uh, we could do at home and we could, could compare notes on. And so um, I made a prototype set of jigs over here at the top left and made my first little project and it seemed doable. So I found every chunk of wood that I had that it was about the right size <laughs> and made another 14 uh, pairs of jigs and milled up a whole bunch of basswood for the Kumiko sticks at the bottom. And um, quite a few gals gave it a try. 
I basically sent them home with the jigs and the materials. And then we had a little tutorial online and uh, half a dozen or so gave it a try. And, and some are still um, puttering away at home. I don't know exactly what they're up to. <laughs> I'd love to see more, more of what they're, they're working on. So these jigs also, um, I would like to teach people in the, sh in the club how to do this. And at the end, I'll have a little blurb for my coasting into Kumiko class. So here's a, just kind of the finished jigs. There's, I'll show more into them later, but above you see there's a, bundles of Kumiko with a blue tape around them. And uh, those were kind of the bundles I made to, to give to the gals to have materials to work with. And there's just plain Kumiko. And then there's the Kumiko with the little uh, dados in them. And those little dados, you could cut those into different sizes and create the grid. Um, so the sizing that I picked, I, I followed Des King and a couple of his examples that I'd seen. He has wonderful YouTube videos, just wonderful, wonderful stuff. So I used his sizing, which is at one eighth inch. The, the, the dimension that you see is an eighth inch wide. And then the, the height sort of elevation is about is a half an inch. And also the wood I used was basswood, which is most people are using basswood here. It just the white color is doesn't have grain and it's very easy to shave with a chisel. Carvers use it because it's so easy to work. Um, and it's really a toolkit. Once you've got the materials, um, it doesn't take much, many tools to cut the little pieces to fill in the jig, to fill in the, the pattern. Uh, the screwdriver is used to adjust the stops. They're sliding stops in the bevel jigs. And um, I'm going to kind of wave my little wand around up here. There's two different bevel jigs. Um, one has 22 and a half degree angle on one end and a 67 and a half on the other. The other one has 45 degrees on one end and 65 and a half on the other. And um, I've got another slide that's kind of complicated, but really I'm putting it in there to highlight what those angles are doing. So they've cut an angle on the end of this chunk of wood and it's at say 45 degrees to the horizontal. And the little piece of Kumiko is gonna fit in the groove and get shaved off at that angle. I notice uh, Ruth, you have a groove on the bottoms of the blocks. Is yeah, and that's, um, um, when machining them, that's kind of easy to do. And that can be used. I use that for a miter box. Oh, okay. Flip it over to the bottom and you can put a stop in or not put a stop in. Then you can put your little Kumiko in there and um, slice it to length. Gotcha. I gotcha. So I've kind of got a little kerf drawn in. Yeah, I've got a, I see those in there. Yeah. On the bottom. Yeah. And um, I've got a picture of it flipped over later. Okay. So you can kind of get a lot of tools in one, just those two blocks of wood. So now when you start putting things together, um, the first step is to put the, the grid together or, or the, uh, the jigumi. And um, you can see the little grooves in them. And there's two pieces have been put in. It's kind of straightforward. Um, but what's kind of interesting, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. The, the size of that kerf, that dado that you cut in the wood, uh, like I'm using an eighth inch saw blade, that's what determines the size of your Kumiko for the grid because you want it to fit right in there snugly. So I've milled my Kumiko really carefully so that it just fits in, inside that, um, that kerf that a saw would cut. And it's about, it's, I, I haven't looked it up, but it's only, it's less than, it's about five, thousands or less uh, of difference in thickness between the the kerf and the thickness of the basswood. Um, so cutting those dados is a lot like cutting up box joints. And here I'm using my miter gauge and I've got an auxiliary fence uh, clamped to it. 
and that auxiliary fence has a little tab on it. And uh, when I, I've got a bundle of Kumiko here, seven of them, seven of them at a time, I've just taped together. And I, I cut one groove, and then I put that groove over the little tab, cut another groove. This picture is of cutting the, the, third, um, the third dado. And um, yeah, this part's pretty easy once you get things set up. The, the um, project that I made that had borders on it is you need to do something a little bit differently. You could see in the bottom, the pieces that will make the uh, grid up above have all their uh, dados cut in them. And again, these are bundles. I've, I've bundled my Kumiko together to make these cuts. Ruth, I have two questions that have come up. Uh, okay. One is with, with the, uh, the language, uh, Kumiko versus Kumiko. Uh, there's one question about how, how did you get the pronunciation? Um, I, uh, I don't know. I might not be doing it right, but I think I've probably, I think I've probably picked it up from listening to people um, on YouTube. So I mean, hopefully I've picked up what they've been saying. Des King uh, studied in Japan and speaks Japanese. So if, I've, if I'm saying it the way he is, then I'm pretty sure that's accurate. But, but I don't really know. I haven't paid much attention to that actually. And then the other, another question is about the process uh, after you've uh, ripped your kumikos uh, to the eighth of an inch. Are you uh, refining those on a drum sander at all, or taking them right out of the saw? I'm not taking them out of the saw. I um, I'm putting them through um, my planer. Hmm. I'm planing them down mm -hmm. just just to take the marks off and get them all planed to the same thickness. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the last question that I have here, uh, Joe promised there would be more, uh, is that when you're bundling your Kumiko for uh, cutting the curves, uh, do you have to adjust the depth of cut with that? Yeah. The, the tape. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You got to. And that's actually been a bear. It's it's I found it really quite time consuming. It's taken about 10 tries <laughs> to try to get those uh, half laps just right because there's not a whole lot to work with. And even then, I think I didn't do it quite right. They weren't quite deep enough. I need to make them a little bit deeper, deeper. So it's just, you know, it's kind of what you see is what you get. It takes some trial and error. And then, so essentially I do it on a piece and then I take the piece apart and test it, make sure it, that I've gotten the right depth. You can, you, I think you kind of need to do it like greater than half of the distance of the- uh, Yes. Yes, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you're not leaving, you're not, yeah, but you don't want to do much more than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So again, here, just showing that with two box joint fences that that uh, register to each other, you can um, get that, that lattice with the different spacings. Mm -hmm. You basically use a setup like, like I'm showing here and just carefully go through the sequence and keep track of what you're doing to get the data where you want them. Yeah, this was the first time I'd seen somebody use a second fence. So I was, this was, was, it was kind of like one of those aha moments. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah, great idea. Exactly. And um, it's um, Matt Kenny who goes through how to do this in his book. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was where that aha came from. Um, he does it slightly differently. Um, but it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just exactly the same idea. So now starting to put things into the grid. The grid's been uh, assembled with glue. And then I've put in the first pieces of the pattern, the diagonals. And um, I haven't, I usually haven't glued them in. Uh, this project, I did glue them in at the end, and you'll see after all the pieces get put in and fit, then I take, then I empty one square at a time and put little dabs of glue on and put all the pieces back into that square. Um, a lot of my little projects, like coasters, I haven't glued at all, uh, other than the putting the grid together, I haven't glued the little pieces in. They're in there pretty snugly, they're not going to fall out, and they're pretty fun to put in and out, <laughs> so they make kind of a fun puzzle. So the diagonals, the first pieces to go in. 
And here's what's going on here. On the left uh, is an obvious diagram, but I'll sort of wave around. There's, we're looking at, you do one square at a time. And the first piece has to be is the diagonal. And over here, I'm showing a diagonal piece and the ends of it have 45, two, each end has two 45 degree bevels on it. That way it fits right into that 90 degree corner. Those two 45s make a 90 degree angle. Oop, that goes in. So that's the first piece. After you get all of those in, then you make these matching pieces right here, which are often referred to, and, and I'll refer to them as hinge pieces because they sort of hinge together here. And they have, they're the most complicated piece. On the ends that go into this 45 degree angle, you've got Bruce, two. We're not, seeing, we're not seeing your cursor right now. Oh, really? Yeah, for oh. some reason it stopped. Uh, oh, and, okay. And, and, and I have another question for you too. Well, well you're thinking about the cursor thing. Okay. Uh, have you seen uh, Teho Kwan's Kamiko videos? He seems to do a lot of work using power tools for yeah. his massive screens. Yeah. Right, I've seen that. Yeah, and then the, the, the second part of that is, are you aware of the different styles such as Teo's versus Kenny's versus Pekovich's? Uh, mm, they're all making the same, when they make the same pattern, it's, yeah, it's the same. Some, there are some variations in how you can make this pattern. Like mm -hmm. Des King goes through three different ways you can uh, do this. And this is probably the most accessible yeah. way to do it uh, by hand. And when I took Pekovich's class, and that's what that's kind of how we did it too. So, yeah, there's a there's a way where you take this hinge piece, and it's actually one piece, and you slice it with a saw blade so that there's just uh, a few fibers of wood at the back, and you just bend it open. And then, but then you need different angles to put the final piece in. And you know, so there are different processes, but this one's pretty commonly used. And uh, I actually found this, the, this diagram when we were doing our, our practice the other day, I found this really, really helpful. This, the diagram on the right, that, you know, because when, when I first look at this uh, uh, design, I go, wow, it's really complicated. But when you break it down into the parts that you have on the, on the right there, it's it's like okay, it's kind of a once again an aha moment. Oh, I get it. So that's how it goes together. Exactly. There's only three different kinds of pieces that go into it. Mm -hmm. The the hinge pieces come in pairs, and they are identical. And you you process them together. You always process them in pairs. So I will. I'll just be waving my hands around here at home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'll try to explain what I'm waving, what I'm doing. Um, anyway, the picture on the right is showing the three different kinds of pieces. And I was saying that those hinge pieces, which are the two intermediate length ones, they're the most complicated ones because they've got three different angles kind of going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's just how it fits together. The cool thing about this pattern, though, and what makes it actually pretty easy to assemble is that the hinge pieces, once the diagonal piece, piece is in, there are uh, 45 degree angles that these hinge pieces fit into. And when you cut the bevels on the end of that piece and you push it into that 45 degree angle, it's very firm in there. It's not flopping around. It's not flapping back and forth. It's very firm. And that helps a lot as you're assembling it together. And then those two hinge pieces, they meet where they meet is the 67 and a half degree angle. Mm -hmm. And in the picture, you'll see that there's, they don't, there's not very much that they touch. They're not they're just touching a little bit. And then the rest of the piece uh, is open to receive the final littlest piece, which uh, I call the locking piece or a key. It goes in and holds it all together. And that last piece, the locking piece is a lot is like the diagonal. It has four 45 degree bevels on it. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all goes together. Those are the pieces. So when I was cutting to, to make those diagonal pieces, you have to figure out how big they are. And uh, one way is you just measure across the, 
where you're going to put it, and then you add about an eighth of an inch. Um, but another way to do it, and this is a different piece, but the concept is the same, is to have somebody like me, uh, your instructor or helper, give you pieces that fit into your grid. <laughs> They're already done. They're two size. You put them in your grid, you feel them, you see how they fit, and you go, oh, that's what size it needs to be. And you use that to set up your, your jigs. And these are, this is a picture of setting up the, the, um, the little miter box to cut long pieces of Kumiko down to rough size to make parts. And this little setup piece is a, is a hinge piece. And the bottom is showing where you've got a, a piece ready to cut. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a little bit less than an eighth of inch longer than the final part. And this just kind of shows what it looks like on the, on the bottom of these beveled jigs. Uh, uh, there's the groove and a kerf, and you put your piece in there and cut it. In this case, I don't have a stop in there to help me re make repeatable cuts. But what I've done is I've, there's a little pencil mark on the very right at the end of the piece that's saying, push the piece to this mark and then cut it off. The, the Kumiko has been cut to rough size and it's going to be put in here and the first angles I put on the hinge piece are the 22 and a half degree bevels. So I've set the stop so that after those bevels are shaved on it, the piece is still going to be a little bit long. And I, that little bit of length is what I'm going to use to shave the other end. So with a setup piece, again, it also can help you it takes a little time and some iterations to set up your jigs just right. And the most frustrating thing is to just keep cutting pieces too short. So here I'm showing a method that helps you keep the pieces long <laughs> rather than too short. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where there should be another hand in there if it weren't holding the camera that would be holding the piece in place. And uh, something like this where I'm shaving uh, a bevel on the hinge piece, there's enough room for me to put my index finger in my left hand in there and I just hold that piece in place. And then use the chisel to take little shavings of the wood off, and I don't have pictures of that, um, but you just take fine shavings, maybe about three, and you get it flush with the surface and you're done. In this case, then I'd flip it over side to side and shave the other so I'd have two bevels on the same end. And here's kind of what, uh, on the right, you sort of see what the piece looks like from the side again. And uh, nice, clean cuts. On the left, I'm showing for the really small pieces like that final hinge piece. It's only five eighths of an inch long. And here it's, you shave a 45 degree bevel on it and a pencil makes a good holder or Mike Pekovich's little, little thingy mm -hmm. makes a good holder too. So this is, the pencil's nice because you can really get, uh, you, can, you can hold really tiny pieces with a pencil where. Yeah, you can hold tiny pieces and it, you can scooch them around yeah. a little bit with that, with that uh, eraser. That mm -hmm. works really well. Mm -hmm. And you can, see what's, you can see what's happening. Here's a couple of clean bevels on the top. You just see you want a, a nice rectangular shape, which means that it's not, that it's square across the piece of wood. Mm -hmm. uh, and the cleaner it is, the fewer gaps there will be in the final piece and it'll just look nice. And the bottom, you can see there's two left, the two left ones. If you don't, um, if your pieces are, your rough pieces, your little wood pieces before you shave them are too short, you're not gonna be able to, to get away, to get rid of all the, the saw cut. You need to be a little long enough so that you can get the bevels to meet cleanly like the piece on the right. Mm -hmm. So here the piece has the hinge has hinge pieces put in it. And now it just needs the locking pieces to go in. And again, I'm not gonna go into detail of the sequencing. There's some sequencing involved because you've got these jigs and you're using both ends of them and you're going back and forth and it can get a little complicated. 
Uh, here's showing the two hinge pieces having been cut two different using both of the bevel gauges. There's 67 and a half degree end because I need, there's two different settings <laughs> for the, for that kind of oddball end of the piece. Anyway, here's the putting the final pieces in the pattern, this locking piece. And they're usually quite snug to hold it all together. And uh, I'll often put them in just with a little tap. Here I get them started by hand and then tap them straight down with a, with a really small hammer. They'll, they can push into, but it's, sometimes it's easier to tap them in. Um, at this point, when all the pieces are in there, you'll see there's a little bit of height variation. And there's a few little shadows here and there, where there's a little bit of the wood that's been kind of pushed aside by the chisel, but the, the far side often doesn't get shaved off very well. So there'll be like little flaps of the wood. Um, and so at the very end, it's you can clean those up with a block, a big block with sandpaper on it that just goes over everything and just kind of smooths, smooths everything out. This is just another peek at sort of a work in progress where I'm piling up hinge pieces, filling out that, filling out my project. And here's this other project when it was all put together. And um, before you saw that it was framed, um, before framing it, I cut off all those little end pieces, all those little ears, and then planed it flush, played it smooth, and then built a frame to go around it. Beautiful. So that's kind of the gist of that making those. Any other questions about the making process? I kind of jumped around, but tried to hit the high points. That was good, well done, and and beautiful work, Ruth. Okay, thanks. Then, um, then I did try another project just to see, or another. I wanted, I'd like to make another project, and trying to decide what to do. So this pattern's kind of neat. And um, I gave it a try. It uses the same equipment, those same angles, those same bevel gauges. Because um, the joint is really like that key. You've really got a middle piece that's just like the key with, a, with hinges on either side. Uh, but this one is a bear to assemble. Like if you look on the right, you know, your, the corners, the pieces that go into the corner of the square, there's not they're not jammed into a corner like those, like on the Asanoha where they're, they're really snug in there. And so you've, there's five loose pieces <laughs> flopping around trying to put it together. And it was really much harder to uh, get all the pieces in place in this one. So I think I could, I'll have to come up with some way to hold things while I'm trying to uh, struggle to get the last piece in. Mm -hmm. Um. Again, as we mentioned before, there's lots of different patterns. Here's uh, Des King's third book. Here's some of the uh, different patterns he has in it. Actually, I think this is from his website, but his third book is about hexagonal patterns, I think. Ruth, can I, can I interrupt for some yeah. questions? Uh, um, Spitzer asked if uh, you used adhesives to hold your display and he said that his the screen that he bought and restored he found evidence of some old adhesive on it um um uh i like on this project i've glued the kumiko pattern together the grid and then the pieces into it and my particular frame i didn't glue it into the frame i just pushed it in um when, and I didn't put paper on the back of it, but when rice paper or trans, other translucent papers are put in the back, they use a, usually use a rice glue that is sort of carefully put on the back uh, and the paper's glued to it. And some of the research I was doing was saying that it's, it's common to replace the paper on a shoji screen, that the, the, this rice glue or starch is kind of reversible or easy to clean, clean off. And so it's common to replace the paper every year or two. So maybe his screens had had paper on the back of them at one time. Um, 
we have a few more questions here. Uh, uh, do you ever use a small plane to cut the bevels instead of a chisel? Um, some people do that. For me, the chisel is easier. Uh, but um, Des King uses a, he uses a, uh, a small block plane and a slightly different kind of a bevel jig. Mm -hmm. And um, he doesn't use stops either for his pieces. He okay. just kind of like holds them in his jig and takes, you know, five shavings or six shavings or whatever. You know, he's got it down to feel. Um, for me, my hands aren't very strong and hanging on to a heavy, for me, any kind of a block plane uh, would be too much work. I wouldn't be able to, I would find it hard to just hang on to that. It's also for me a little bit challenging to get it to scoot across the, the, the jig, uh, the angle jig. Finally, a plane only takes, always takes one size shaving. With a chisel, you can take large, medium, and small shavings. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can take as fine a shaving with a chisel as you can with a plane, and you can take a bigger sh uh, shaving when you have more to take off. Yeah. So it's really efficient. Um. Do, do 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 the do like people like Des King? Do they also use bass basswood for their work? A lot of people use basswood. Um, I think he has, I, I think he uses basswood, but he also might. He, I think he he's in Australia. I think he might use something called Huon pine. Oh, and okay. um, I think he's also maybe used some yellow cedar. Alaskan yellow cedar would probably work. Um, yeah, Pekovich that, used, uh, I think it was eastern white pine, uh -huh. is, what he, is what he did, what he used. Okay. And uh, then there's some questions about where to get basswood. Where where do you buy your basswood? Um, uh, you can get basswood, and all the wood suppliers have it in some form or other. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to pick up half inch thick boards from Woodcraft, Woodcrafters on Woodcraft the inner east side. Yeah. which was really handy because they were just a little bit thicker than half an inch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was enough for me to plane them smooth to get my half inch thickness gotcha. without having to take a bigger board down. Uh, sure, sure. Um, uh, let's see here. We, yeah, Woodcrafters, uh, Woodcraft has basswood in all sorts of uh, sizes. Uh, the Bland tells us and Bland works there. So he would know. Right. So, yeah. Right, right. So, but I was getting it. I was getting it at the other shop, um, and they had big, big half-inch boards, which was nice. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and also, Crosscut has has you know bigger boards. Mm -hmm. um, you can also, if you're kind of a hobbyist, you can the hobby stores like Tammy's Hobby has small pieces of basswood that are half-inch, and yeah. actually, I've seen them. I think at Blink's art store as well. They have um, small, but they're like a dollar a piece of wood, but you get like a half inch by one eighth inch piece for like a, a dollar for like, I don't know, 16 or 20 inches. Okay. Yeah. Ruth, I think we could, we could go on for a long, long time, but I don't want people to, uh, to miss out on your little promo of your class. So okay. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, oh, I did want to show this one off just that Des King had this really big one this pretty amazing large screen with all kinds of parts. And then, um, so yeah, uh, teaching a class, uh, we did one and we, we really weren't able to get the, the coaster made in four hours. Uh, I think it's doable. And um, I think I can streamline it a little bit and we can be more successful on that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to teach a couple more of those. Don't have dates yet, but should be coming to a shop near you soon in uh, March, <laughs> April. Right. Also, here's a slide of some of those names I mentioned and some places to look at. Um, Des King, Mike Pekovich, Matt Kenny, Big Sand have their websites, YouTube. Those are the names. If you got your phone, if you're interested, get your phone out and take a picture. Um, there's a lot of great stuff on, uh, on the web. Oh, and uh, Ed asked, Ed Ferguson asked, uh, is Kamiko done on, uh, when you do it on a large scale, do they use thicker and longer segments or? Uh, um, 
sometimes yeah sometimes there's the scale can change yeah like um um like the screens will have probably a little bit thicker pieces if it's a full size if it's a, a shoji um mm. and it's also sometimes smaller mm. okay so you can kind of make it to whatever size you just need to pick your equipment you know like i made the jigs i use i made them for half an inch great well, any other questions, B? Uh, you know, this this has been all that I thought it would be, Ruth. Uh, really happy to have you do this. Um, what do you think you're going to do? Do you have some project in mind that's you're going to that you have something you're going to do next? Or I see you're already doing different designs. So I tried a different design. I I I, I I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I just can't quite. Nothing is really calling me. Can you go um, back to that uh, resource slide again? I didn't get my yes, yes. Yeah. Ginny yeah. is asking for that, and she's another example of the advantages of uh, doing the uh, uh, the Zoom meeting. She's uh, watching us from Arizona. Yeah, I love the Zoom meetings. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, if there are no more questions. You get the rest of the night off, you know? So, <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Ruth, thanks very much. It was very well done and you should not be afraid of yeah. making these presentations in the in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I, knew it would be, I knew it would be great. And, and uh, so it's really good. It's really cool. Um, Bravo. Looking forward to your class and we have, you know, and I think that this is a great opportunity for a lot of us. So. Okay. Thank you. So if there's nothing else for the good of the guild, we will call it a night. I appreciate all of you participating and showing up tonight. We will have our next meeting the third Tuesday of March. That's right. And let me tell you who the presenter is. Oh, yes. Be. Yes. Uh, if I can pull it up here real quick. And the answer is going to be... Um, Max Sheldon on the Panto router. So we were talking about Panto routers. He's going to do a presentation on that in uh, for our March meeting on the, on the 15th. So, uh, we, you know, people have already talked some about that during the social hour. And so, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, tune in for that for information on the Panto router because I, re I really don't know squat about them and uh, uh, I think this is a good opportunity for us all to get it. Get I'm sure he's going to have order forms for all of us at the end of that presentation. Yes, that's that would not be a bit surprised. Okay, thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for participating tonight. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Good night, Joe, Ruth, Mike. Yes. Bye bye. <laughs>